All right, today we're gonna to go through community, content, and kit bashing. What we're gonna to cover, today we're gonna to talk about the community. And by that I mean the, P, the isometric VTT community, the people out there that are interested, or as some have called it, iso-curious, thinking about maybe mixing in some isometric art into their online role-playing game. Understanding all the different players in that community and how they all work together. Looking through some of the creator content and how to find it, as well as a conversation, an interview on kit bashing uh, in that community world. So first of all, understanding community. Community does not mean free, right? Though obviously it's very related to free because sometimes the best community is the easiest community to share. Stuff is just getting tossed around uh, and kind of shared between people in the ecosystem. But community is a little bit broader than that. Take a step back and you'll realize that a lot of the platform owners, the creators, uh, and the users all have to come together in order to make community work, to make it healthy, to make it thrive, to make it grow. Platform owners have to create a space for people to uh, you know, share and utilize art that doesn't come from them as a first party, uh, right? Whether that's something like the Steam Workshop uh, for video games or, or maybe a marketplace or maybe just the ability, you know, the software tools in order to load in uh, compendiums and modules and other things that come from not the creators of the software tools themselves. Creators also play a massive role in community uh, because, well, uh, oftentimes they're the ones hosting uh, some of the best discords and some of the best places for you to share and hack and, and use content that's from a consistent style and not just grabbed off of Google image search. And then, of course, users are the heart of community because, you know, if we don't start talking to each other and explaining to the creators and everybody else what we want, if we don't find ways to get excited about it, there's not going to be a community. So let's get into where in this community uh, are good places to find isometric content. So first of all, where I got started, where I first ran into isometric art assets for VTTs was the Roll20 Marketplace. Not everybody uses Roll20, but that's okay because you can download anything you buy there and have the actual files for. It's just a good place to find stuff. Added benefit, if you are using Roll20, things you buy on the Roll20 Marketplace don't count against your usage quota and it still uh, supports creators. Creators get about 70%, which is kind of the going rate in a lot of uh, online marketplaces for how much uh, creators get. 70%, you know, reasonably fair. Now, if you wanted more of that money to go to the art artist, maybe check out their Patreon. A lot of them have them. It's a way to kind of subscribe and get new content maybe every month or maybe a couple times a month. Each creator is different. They set their goals differently. Patreon has really low fees, so creators might be getting 90% or more. Great way to support artists. So definitely check out, most of your artists probably have these, and they might give you back catalog access or access to like a Discord community of people using that art. And both of those, both of those things are massively useful. Some of these creators have been making art for years and just kind of getting in there, you might instantly unlock massive amounts of content. Definitely, you know, subscribe to them while you're using them. Um, you know, not everybody's in a position where they can subscribe forever, but uh, you know, those types of back catalog rewards, those those stay possible by, you know, obviously people sticking around. Um, sometimes finding stuff on Patreon isn't particularly easy. So on my isometric landing page, uh, I am, which I'll link below. I am kind of keeping a list of creators that are making isometric art assets just so that it makes it a little easier for people to kind of click through and browse different art styles. Maybe it gives you some inspiration. Uh, but just to focus on three right now, nobody sponsored this video. Um, but you see these three artists, I think their art goes well together really nicely. Two Brave Puffins makes a lot of the NPCs for my game. There's actually now quite a big catalog uh, from her. Uh, I think her art has a lot of personality and a lot of character. So I use them for a lot of named NPCs. Epic Isometric uh, makes just some of the best big collections of monsters. He's starting to make uh, more colored assets and even some animated assets that I've started to use. Uh, and obviously has just this huge library of stuff because he's been doing this Patreon for quite a while now. And then Isometric Worlds, I find, makes some real amazing set piece kind of like layers and boss battles and often comes with like a couple of really nicely drawn tokens that are colorized beautifully. Um, so definitely check out Epic Isometric, Two Brave Puffins and Isometric Worlds. Uh, I, I think they go together nicely. But you may find your own style. You may find that some of the other stuff is what you like uh, or you might just uh, like grabbing stuff other places. 
So let's get into some of those other places where you can get ideas. Sometimes it's the same artist sort of just advertising in different places. Um, but check out Reddit. There is a Reddit subreddit called uh, Isometric D&D. Um, and it's mostly free samples, similar to some of the battle maps for top-down D&D. But it may be a good place for you to just kind of browse and really quickly see a bunch of different art styles, full resolution of these free samples. Check out Hero Forge. Hero Forge has the ability to take uh, isometric screenshots of the minis you make there. This is a collection of NPCs that I made for uh, a session of my game when they visited a, a different pirate island and all the people they would meet on that island. Uh, and I cranked all of these out during a 45-minute television episode that my wife was watching. Uh, so this kind of shows that you, you really can, uh, you know, get a lot of mileage, uh, get a lot of tokens out really quickly. Um, other ideas for places to find stuff, check out itch.io. Just do a search for isometric. This is a place that sometimes video game artists sell or even give away video game art assets. Check out ArtStation sort of like a artist portfolio where you might get some ideas or get samples from artists that have been making video game art for isometric video games. There's some really gorgeous stuff there from some AAA games and mobile games. And also, if you know how to use Blender, uh, oftentimes you can find some really get great uh, 3D models or uh, 3D models from the 3D printing community that you can render into isometric tokens. They don't always come shaded, you know, colored, but you, you might be able to do that yourself or just you know, play them in black and white, they look pretty good. Um, the last thing I wanted to get into, and this is where the interview comes in, is Discord. The Discord communities for uh, the Patreon artists are sometimes some of the highest value you'll ever get out of community. Uh, just finding other people that are using the same assets and learning how to use them and making them work. Um, you, you Sometimes you can just like type in the search for the monster you're looking for and find some really great stuff in there. I get a lot of my stuff just from things that other people have posted and colorized or hacked together. But looking at how they get hacked together, I wanted to point out one thing. So this is an example from a great uh, user of these communities called Lewinidas. Uh, and this is a map from Curse of Strahd that's assembled from uh, mostly epic isometric artwork though, that I wouldn't be surprised if there's some other kind of props hanging out in here from a few other artists. Um, but there's something really special about these, which is the way that he does walls. Right? And that's just an idea that he put forward just trying to solve a problem that we're all trying to solve. How do you get it so the walls don't get in the way? So looking at Lewinidas did here, um, there's like these half walls right? that he's specially made. And he made them, let me kind of bring up a, a zoom in of those in black and white. So this is like one of his half walls. He made these by kind of taking full walls and editing them down and adding some rubble, you know, kind of to, in Photoshop or something to, to make them, uh, I think he's a paint.net guy, but uh, you know, to make them uh, these half walls that he uses as props and he places them so that people can tell there's a wall there, but then he doesn't have to show and hide them. You can still kind of see behind them because they're half walls. That's kind of awesome, a great idea. Let's look at some other great ideas. Here's an example of taking two tokens drawn by the same artist, Epic Isometric, and then the fans combining them into the inevitable conclusion of what happens when you give us an owl token and a bear token. Well, you, of course, we're going to go and Photoshop that into an owl bear. That looks pretty awesome. You know, this is the classic example of taking pre made stuff and bashing it together, uh, and what it's called is kit bashing. To explain kit bashing, where that term comes from, uh, let's jump over to uh, the person who actually taught that term to me, and that is my dad, this guy. Uh, so let's jump over and let's interview my dad. Hey, Pop. Hello, son. Thanks for uh, taking the time with me today. I wanted to interview you on your experience for with Close Encounters and the, the topic of kit bashing. I think... Uh, that's a term that gets used in online D&D as people are using and reusing and mashing together some of the content they get from different creators or different commercial packs of content. Um, but that's a term that you taught me actually related to movie model making. Do you know where the term comes from? Is, is it from movie model making or is it older than that? I think it's probably a, a, a little bit after I was working in all those models where uh, various creative people would combine models, sometimes very expensive Japanese models, to do their own custom versions of, of airplanes and boats and stuff like that. That's all I know. And in the, the case of what we did, 
uh, for extra little tiny details on a very, very large miniature, uh, we went out and got commercial uh, model kits to, to help fill in the details, very carefully chosen. Uh, kit bashing, of course, is a term that you taught me way back in the day when you explained what that meant for Close Encounters of the Third Kind, which you worked on. Right. Yeah. Uh, what was what was your role? I mean, that that's one of your first movie credits, right? It's my first and uh, first mo big movie credit of two. But <laughs> it went away real quick. But it was uh, I got hired basically as the overall clerk, gopher, uh, helper, assistant, and I ended up working the editorial. I projected seventy millimeter dailies, and a lot of the time I just hang out in. Greg Jean's model shop and helped him build all of the models and miniatures and landscapes for for the movie. So Close Encounters, uh, one of the one of the photos you sent me is is that Dennis Murin next to the? Yes, that's Dennis Murin. He was brought on. He finished Star Wars, and we grabbed him for three weeks to shoot all the mothership shots. Okay, it's the same year as Star Wars. It's 1977. So was ILM on that, or were the crews similar at all? The ILM crew got set up in 1975, and when it was all set up, the production manager didn't have a lot to do anymore. So when Close Encounters started up in 1976, he came down to Marina del Rey, and that's about the same time I got hired, and I was his assistant throughout the making of the thing. So when we'd go back and forth, I saw a lot of the stuff being shot or the setups for Star, Star Wars, uh, when we went up there to borrow things or to return things or whatever. And uh, apparently when that wrapped, they immediately hired Dennis Murin because he was free mm -hmm. to Mothership, which was not as difficult as what he was doing up there because it didn't have, only had, you know, two channels of motion control as opposed yeah. to a dozen. Also didn't have to blow it up. You didn't have to blow it up. <laughs> right. it's, just, it's just a big chandelier. Right. So th this mothership, um, the, the kit bashing story you always told me was running around L.A. looking for parts. Can you tell us that story? Well, he, uh, Greg Jean really made all of it all by himself, but he had like three, a couple other model makers making parts for him. And then unskilled labor model makers like me was drilling holes in little uh, uh, metal cigar tubes to be the, the towers that are rounded on it, that sort of thing. But uh, and he made, the thing was supposed to be like a chandelier with a million sticky things coming out of it in all directions all around. Tall masts, and most of them he built himself. They're about this long and, uh, you know, it just hit his, it took him forever to do that. But for a lot of the small detail, uh, he went to some hobby stores and was looking for something like a battleship model or something that had masts or antennae on it that he could mm -hmm. use. And just that summer, this model for Jacques Cousteau's uh, Ocean Explorer Calypso came out. And it had not only the two radio masts, but it had two, I don't know, the kind of the kind of things, masts, they aren't really cranes, but masts that, that like fishermen might use to pull in a net or something. I don't know. Maybe it's what they swung the submarine out and dropped into the ocean. Jacques Cousteau, but he loved those. And so, you know, but he he went to his hobby store and there were only two of them there. That gave him like four masks and he needed like 50. So I drove all over town buying up all these models. And I, I guess we, I never found out what happened to all those boat models, but they never went, I never got one. They <laughs> went everywhere, but there were just like, you know, I was sitting there and I'd sit there all day long and cut the flash off of these pieces of plastic and then spray paint them and put them in a row. and. And he'd go along and do the job better than I could and put it on the boat, uh, put it on the ship. In the film industry, was there ever any kind of animosity between crews or concern about using commercial stuff or was just enough spray paint and LEDs and lights that no one would ever notice? No one would ever notice. I mean, there are, you know, I, I think it's either the, the Halloween movie, Michael Myers, I believe, wears a mask of, you know, uh, Shatner from Star Trek or something like that and no one cares uh, and uh, I, I can't think of an instance where someone ripped off somebody else's model or something and put it in a movie. 
I think at this point it's almost required digitally with R2-D2 is required to be in every movie that has special effects somewhere, right? Oh, I see. Okay. You know, you, you see him flying by in the debris when the Enterprise explodes in, in, <laughs> the, in, in the modern movies. So I think if there's just Easter eggs everywhere, every which way. And almost yeah. Up, yeah. We used to call that kludge. Okay. <laughs> because it was a, there was a, uh, it was a design idea where you, you wouldn't have a, a clean spaceship you'd have a dirty one with a big mess everywhere sure so, like the like the imperial star destroyer right if you had if you had all of us if you had all of this chaos and more stuff than you can even look at it gives you the idea that oh this is reality as right. opposed to something that's polished and clean out of the box well it was the 70s i mean right, right. like dark stars that way yeah yeah um well, I really appreciate uh, the time to chat, and uh, this is a fun little just kind of connection between uh, you know what you used to do and and what the movies we like watching and some of the stuff that's going on uh, all the time. As you know, frankly, some of these tools are kids learn this in elementary school now with Photoshop. So, well, I appreciate you taking me to that museum to see the mothership when it was finished thirty years after it went away. Yeah, it's it's uh, it, it's kind of neat. So that's right here in my city in DC, and uh, that was neat to go see that. Um, it's right next to a bunch of other stuff, right? That's sort of. I don't understand why the rest of our relatives weren't all that impressed with me for that, but you know, what can you do? I thought they thought they thought it was neat. I say, look over there. See that little corner? I brushed that little piece of plastic. That was my job. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thanks, Pop. Great, okay. great talking to you. Thank you. So that was fun. You know, I haven't seen my dad in a year, so nice talking to him and talking about something fun. Let's go through some other examples. Um, this is a example of flying minotaur artwork. So that's the art of the town in the bottom left, combined with some epic isometric uh, art and some cool lighting and shading and colorization and some extra textures all thrown together by Miaradas. I do not know how to print. Nobody knows how to pronounce my online name. I don't know how to pronounce anybody else's online name. Uh, it, this stuff. I think just looks great. This is a map from Descent into Avernus. Uh, There's a total kit bash, right? It's art from a couple of different places, uh, you know, up leveled by the users and then shared in the community. Fantastic stuff. This is an example of me kind of half making uh, a map by taking Michael Schley artwork from uh, Curse of Strahd, rotating it and doing an example of the main room of the Amber Temple from Curse of Strahd. And kind of like laying it out as an idea of how you would do this in a full setup. And then I posted it on the Epic Isometric community. And then here we go, Sean Langze improves the whole thing, finishes it, adds better detail, better artwork, uh, you know, kind of, I think, makes it way better, uh, and then uses this in his game. Here's an example of uh, Foci, who's been doing a lot of stuff with tokens, taking some, uh, you know, some stock art of an abolith and then putting it through some filters and doing some edge line work, kind of some automatic stuff. Uh, to kind of make it match the hand-drawn art style of some of the tokens that we use from other artists and then putting it on a token base and sharing it in the community. So these are examples of kit bashing and they're all kind of pulled from the community. Examples that of other users like us are using in their games and uh, definitely kind of a good place to go for inspiration or even, you know, whole tokens. Now, if you're going to go and download some of this kit bashed artwork, one recommendation, recommendation I definitely do have is for you to stay organized. So one, if you download something, check its file name. Make sure that, that file name is something that you will be using to search for it later. So make sure in that previous example that it's something like Abolith, because that's the word that you're going to use to search for that if you're a D&D GM or player. Um, and also, the other tip I have is you should be downloading all the stuff and keeping it organized in one place so it's easy to back up, so you don't lose it, and also, frankly, so you don't get locked into an ecosystem. It's really easy to kind of just use an online tool as the place that you keep your library. But if you ever want to switch off of that online tool, suddenly you'll find out like, oh, I can't end my subscription to this tool that I don't like anymore uh, because all my stuff is there and it would take me too much time or I would lose access to it or something. Make sure you always have a copy. If, if you went and you know just got it from the community or you got it from the Roll20 Marketplace or something like that, Make sure you got a copy of it on your hard drive somewhere. Make sure you back that up somewhere, uh, whether it's just a key drive or something, because you know you can do all the work of staying organized 
and getting that downloaded. You don't want to lose that, or you don't want to feel like you're only using the tool because you're locked in. You want to avoid lock-in. You want to use the tools because you love them, and you have fun, and, and, you're, and you're enjoying everything about that tool, not because you feel trapped there. Um, and, uh, and that's about it. So uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, hope that was useful. Hope people got some ideas on where to get some cool content. And uh, I'm going to keep making videos on isometric and other topics. We've got some cool stuff coming up uh, from some of the plugins. And uh, I'd love to show people what's going on in my games. All right. Take care. I don't script any of my videos. Uh, so um, as a professional editor who taught me how to use a linear editing machine back in the 90s um right. you'll you'll be embarrassed if you ever watched uh my little videos because they're uh, they're not scripted and i do massive jump cuts in the middle of sentences to correct inaccuracies once i re uh, listen to it afterwards is it linkable when you get this thing going yeah sure i'll send it to me and i'll say well here's another chance to be embarrassed